Well, hello there, Harry Ant Mueller, Bob Moore Cook, uh, visiting with you again, along with my dear friend, uh, Jay Ray Hayes. And uh, it's been six years since we did the first half of this interview. How many? It was 2012. It's been six years ago we did that. No, 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 no. Couldn't have been. No, no, no. No, because my youngest son is 30 years old. Okay. He'll be 31, and he was, he was still a, a teenager. He was, he, was, he was still in high school. Uh, I'm not talking about the time he came to my house. I'm talking about the time. Oh, the one over at uh, Camp, Avery. Camp, Camp Avery. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. Well, uh, where we had gotten to in the story last time, you had uh, arrived in North Vietnam after two and a half months uh, of. Uh, on the march, and you gave me a little bit of a thumbnail sketch, and then we ran out of time and tape, and kind of wanted to pick up from there and also talk about what it was like for you after you came back to to the U.S. When when you first arrived in, at uh, at a detention center, you were you did not go to the Hanoi Hilton, I think. You said that you went to the plantation. Is that right? No, 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 no. We ended up in what we called portholes. They were uh, tiger cages. Okay. And we were there oh, about four, four months. Okay. Four and a half months. Then they moved us to another area. L let me ask about tiger cages. I've seen photos of the tiger cages used in South Vietnam, and those were like, uh, they were cages in a pit. Were you guys down in the pit like no. that? Hmm. No, we were in a hut hmm. with individual little cells that were just a little bit wider than my shoulders hmm. and I couldn't stand up upright. Mm -hmm. And they were long enough to where I could lay down, but then at the bottom were stocks so they put your feet in hmm. and then lock the door. So you were by yourself with individual cells. And the reason why we call it portholes is there was a hole cut up in here to where they could look in to make sure that you didn't escape, which was, I think they saw too many James Bond movies. Mm -hmm. Then from there, we left and ended up crossing the Red River mm -hmm. by Sampan. Mm -hmm. And they took us through various villages tied up so people could beat on us because we were pilots. Everybody was a pilot mm -hmm. as far as they were concerned. Their mm -hmm. propaganda was that. <clears throat> I was geared for that. We ended up in something uh, it's hard to describe. There was a bunch of concrete buildings. I think they'd been a French warehouse or something. Uh, but one of the buildings had a D and a 1 on it. Mm -hmm. So we called it D1. Okay. And uh, I don't know if it's still there or not. All I know is that termites had gotten so bad that they were coming up through the cracks. In the foundation. Hmm. The funny stories, believe me. We had a spider that used to hang on the wall, and it was only about yay big. And we would sit there and watch that spider, and he would dip down, mm -hmm. and you'd see a mound of dirt that termites were pushing out. Mm -hmm. And it's like he was sitting there, or she was sitting there listening. Mm -hmm. And I guess when one of them came up close to push out, it would drop down, grab itself a termite, and go right back up its web. So it was something, you know, interesting to watch. Entertainment. Yeah. Yes. It was, it's on it was television it, tonight. Yes. We're going to watch the It spider. was enter entertaining. And there was three of us in this cell. And the problem was... You could hear the termites eating 
your bed because mm-hmm. it was a wooden pallet mm-hmm. that they had put up on like stock it was about that far off the ground mm-hmm. and you could hear this constant crunch 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 and you'd get up and look and you'd see little piles of dust but the termites were just they were eating your bed that's when the shit really hit the fan with the tremendous amount of physical abuse and I ended up back in solitary confinement so I spent about a year was the abuse because of interrogation and they thought you weren't cooperating or what? Oh, they accused me of being part of the CIA. Mm-hmm. That's thanks to James V. DiBernardo mm-hmm. and the fact that he had named names, missions that we ended up AFVN ended up in a way doing a lot more stuff than just broadcasting television. Mm -hmm. We supported the Vietnamese THVN. Mm -hmm. We built their station. Right. Nobody from Saigon came. We built that station. Okay. That was myself and Don Goon. Okay. And then we had, I had to teach the Marines how to solder wires, how to hook up connectors, and move some of the heavy gear. We built that station. Okay. The CBs came in and built a soundproof studio for them. Right. And the building that we were in, we got yanked out and were sent across the street, per se, into this little villa, and we were all crammed into this one place. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> we ended up doing stuff with Just Pal which was the Joint United States Public Affairs Office, right. which was a cover for the agency. Okay. Uh, they had us fly Air America, which was a cover for the agency. Sure. And uh, civilian clothes, no dog tags, no weapons, and going out into these damn areas. Sometimes I was wondering if we might have been in North Vietnam. Who the hell knows? Setting up 21-inch black and white TVs with a little hum generator, or in the mm-hmm. antenna and get them set up so they could watch THPN. Right. So Di Bernardo had told them all about this stuff, so they figured you were a spy. Yeah. Okay. Because they knew who Just Pal was, sure. and Cords, and all the other agencies that were in the city. Now the problem was, the year prior to us going up there, they had riots. Uh, Buddhists, uh, they were having a hard time with the Catholics who were controlling the southern part of Vietnam. And uh, they rioted, they burned the USIS library. Mm-hmm. And we were captured right next to it mm-hmm. right. after the battle, well, doing whatever. The State Department wanted television in Hawaii wasn't the Marines or anybody else wanting TV up there. The State Department wanted TV up there for one specific purpose, to see if we would survive against a hostile civilian population in the city of Way. Mm-hmm. We went on the air. The Marines did not want us in Fubai. MACV didn't want us mainly because of the antenna and the fact of the guy wires, there was really no room. And of course at night, you had this light that blinked, which was an aiming stable. The first night we went on the air, we got mortared. Pissed everybody off because prior to that time, nobody jacked with anybody in the city. Now, outside the city, we'll shoot and kill you, but it's kind of a tacit agreement because right across the river, on the north side of the Perfume River, was a sanctuary over there. The NBA used to come in for R&R. Well, we you, knew that. You guys were an attractive target because if they could take the TV station off the air, that would be a, say, look what we can do. Exactly. 
Exactly. Um, but going back to the situation there after you had been captured, it was because of Di Bernardo who said that uh, this is why they were torturing you to get in there. Yeah. Now they didn't mess with Don Gouin or Anderson because like they told them, you've been in your military too long, we can't do anything with you. So they, put, they picked the youngest and the lowest rank to work on. Hmm. Thinking that you would be the most malleable? Yeah. Okay. I remember one instance where getting an attitude check <clears throat> and I looked at him I said, you know, your whole system reminds me of the of Animal Farm. Did you ever read that book? <laughs> Apparently somebody did. They didn't like that. No, yeah. they got pissed off. You've been listening to your propaganda too long. I said, yeah, but I've been listening to your shit too. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it doesn't work. Yes, 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 yes. Punishment, punishment, punishment. So how often were you interviewed, if that's the right word? Well, initially we were interviewed quite a bit, then after, after a while, it got to the point where we would be sitting on these little stools and of course they would be sitting up, which psychologically the superior and your inferior type stuff, mm -hmm. and they would read telexes from Bulgaria, Romania, Poland, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, all of the communist bloc countries, China, Cuba, mm -hmm. praising the fight of the Vietnamese against the U.S. imperialist aggressors. Mm -hmm. And talk about all the airplanes they shot down. And every time they saw the word us, even though it wasn't U.S., they'd be reading along and all of a sudden they go, U.S., and we're, and we're sitting there going, trying not to laugh. Yes. And they, they, they would go out, they were practicing their English is all they were doing, and they would leave and another one would come in with the same shoes on, wearing the same watch, because they would swap off. Swap watch because they want to look well dressed. Yes, yes. <laughs> These little plastic shoes that, the only way I can describe them is, I've got two younger sisters, one is 10 years younger, the other one is 21 years younger. Mm -hmm. The one that was 10 years younger, I can remember as a young soldier, she got this doll for Christmas, and it was called a Patty Play Pal. I'll never forget it. It was a great big doll mm -hmm. that if you took the hand and went like this, the legs would go and it would walk with you. Oh. And it had these plastic shoes that looked just like the ones that, that this These guy was wearing. Work. Yeah. And it still had the little broken strap on it because you knew he changed it because he'd leave and then this guy would come in with the same shoes on with the, wearing, same, the, same, with the same watch. Yeah. They're trying to psych you out. You spotted them. Good for you. Oh, they would go on and on and on and on and on and on. And, but the funniest thing was talking about shooting down unmanned pilotless spy planes and capturing the pilot. That's good. And we would sit there kind of going, a drone, they shot down a drone <laughs> and captured the pilot. <laughs> not, too, not too bright. But to jump ahead, I okay. went back to Vietnam in 17. Okay. 50 years to the day I started my second tour in Vietnam. I went to Hanoi Hilton, or the Wallow Prison, which means the furnace, mm -hmm. or the oven. I had a hard time at first looking at the past relief on the walls of what they had done to the Vietnamese. And then we went to the American section of what pictures all over the wall. And then there was John Anderson, 
myself, John Deering, Don Gulen, and Dennis Thompson. Dennis Thompson was 5th Special Forces and was captured at Long Bay. Okay. Long Bay was an interesting story. It's the first time that the North Vietnamese used armor and they come down and cross the river and attacked Long Bay with tanks. Mm -hmm. End of his story. Pictures on the wall. Then another picture showing our group leaving. My name and, and the other ones are up there and they're actually spelled right. I was, I was impressed. But we were pilots. Mm -hmm. So I got the curator of the museum to come down since this was the American section. The guy spoke really good English and a woman was there and she started to speak English but then she clammed up and just strictly Vietnamese. And I told him, I said, this picture's wrong. Hmm, could not be. I said, sure it is. I said, you spelled my name right. And I said, you got the date wrong. I said, it was March when I came out of here. Are you sure? I said, yeah, March 5th. I was released from here, March 5th. And I said, I wasn't a pilot. You think looking at you and looking at the picture going right Well, I've there? got a whole shit ass load of people standing out there that speak English, taking pictures of me, pointing to the picture of me. Hmm. He said, what do you mean? I said, I wasn't a pilot. I said I was enlisted, mm -hmm. and I said I was captured in South Vietnam. So I wasn't shot down. Mm -hmm. So he wanted an interview. I said, okay, fine. And then they brought the camera in, and I got polite. Because basically I told him he was full of shit. And uh, I explained to him what I did. I said I was a television broadcast engineer. I said I built TV stations, operated them, maintained them. And that's mm -hmm. what I did in Vietnam. Hmm. He was fascinated by that. Yeah, I said, it should be. that's what I did. And I said, the picture's up there. I said, two of us were engineers, the other three were broadcasters. So that was the fly bobby that made it north. <clears throat> Out of the nine, that was there. Well, one got away. Well, what about Dee Bernardo? They had no pictures of him, or he was in another section? Yeah, the there was another there. picture of him, but not up on the wall. Okay. I've got a picture of him that I, that I gleaned from the North Vietnamese news agency, something that was on the web, and it showed a picture of him getting off the bus, leaving to come home to the airport. Di Bernardo has not showed up for anything. He wouldn't go to the ceremony for the induction into the Hall of Fame, and uh, he was invited but declined to go. You know why? Yeah, because he people are going to say bad things to him. Right. And I told this full colonel. He gave me a challenge coin, and he said to me, "He said you really would have shot Di Bernardo." I said, "Yeah, I regret the fact that I didn't shoot him." I wanted to take out that machine gun position. They didn't they didn't see us. And I could have taken them out with my M14. But he said, no, 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 don't shoot at them. And we're too busy running between the holes blown in the walls between the houses as we're trying to get the MACV compound. And that machine gun turned around, opened up, and ended up killing Steve Straub. So I hold him responsible for Tom Young, Straub, and Courtney Niles, their death. Should have never happened. <clears throat> His rationale was MACB compound, there was no room for us. Excuse me, they would have found room somewhere. And the fact is that he didn't have a sleeping bag and he wasn't going to sleep on the floor. So you and you and you, you sit outside and I'll man the phones with MACV and coordinate with them. 
What do they train you to do? Cut communications. Yeah. No phone, no radio, nothing. We tried to get Frick 25s from Saigon. You don't need them. You're in the city. You got a telephone. Mistake. Big mistake. TONE for that station was not up to snuff. We were supposed to have certain things. We never got them. Well, you don't need them up there. You're in the city. Sure we are. A city that's wide open. Yeah. I want to direct your attention. About yeah. Your time. Uh, it's okay. North Vietnam. We did get all of that or much of that on, on the, the, the first year. <clears throat> In fact, I sat down and I re-watched it all last night and getting ready for today and I'm sitting there thinking, because uh, <laughs> I'm not getting any younger either. Your memory is really good telling exactly the same story. I mean, well, I don't have good. craft yet when it comes to that. Hmm? I don't have craft yet for when it comes to that. Craft? C-R-A-F-T. Yeah. Can't remember a fucking thing. Oh. Okay, no, you don't. You're, you're, you're sharp. But see, you're you, start with, you start with CRS. Uh, I can't remember. Shit. Oh. C oh, CRS. But at your age, you got crafts, so that's okay. <laughs> All right. Sometimes. Somewhat. One of the things that I'd like to know about your experience while you were in North Vietnam, you would mentioned the, the interrogation, the interviews that you had, and the punishment that you did. So you haven't told us what they did to you in terms of punishment. Kneel down with your hands up, your hands fall. They beat you with a bamboo stick. Take your towel, stuff it in your mouth, kick the shit out of you. Tied you up where two your elbows were touching behind your back. And take a rope, come around your thumbs and up your wrists. And then turn around and take your hand like this, pick you feel the tendons and everything in the shoulders just going. <coughs> I've got problems to this day. I've complained to the VA and they tell me that's oh, because you're a diabetic. Oh, okay. So fifty years ago I wasn't a diabetic and I had problems, but now it's because I'm a diabetic. Okay, whatever. We're jacking you around. Not, not so much anymore. <laughs> Got a letter last week. You're going to love this. The VA sends me a letter that says, Oh, our records show that you were a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Did you know that you can get compensation for, and I'm looking at a long laundry list, and I'm going, Really? I can get more than 100%? I've got all that shit. What the hell are you talking about? I've already... I was going to call him on the phone. I, no, I better not. That's. Well, you weren't the only one to get that letter, I bet. No, but it's just the fact that, oh, oh, by the way, you were a prisoner of war. Really? You, you, you like just they, figured that out? Like they had to remind you? or Yeah. Or, or they just, oh, we happen to be looking through, oh, hey. That's the way it goes. Well, they start, you started out in the Tiger Cages, then you went to D1. D1, and that's where they split everybody up again. And it was myself, Ed Flora, and Bill McMurray. Ed Flora was MACV SOG, Studies and Observation Group. The Sneaky Pete's. Yes. He got shot up in Laos and captured. I think he was the only one out of his detachment that made it out. And his arm was all all screwed up. The round had come through and spiraled through and he ended up with a pretzel-like arm. And Bill McMurray was at Long Bay. He got captured. As a matter of fact, he lost the tip of his finger from the blast from a tank that had come into the wire. So I was with those guys. 
and then they separated us. <clears throat> Apparently they were listening to our conversations. Derogatory, of course. And uh, they split us up. And they were real s sneaky about it. They took Bill out of the room and he disappeared. And we looked at each other going, uh-oh, shit's at the fan. Then they came in and got the both of us and took us to another, to the building that had D1 on it with a larger room in it. And we're sitting there. Next thing you know, they come in and they take Laura. And he disappears. And there I'm sitting there like this going, hmm. Well, <clears throat> into solitary confinement, and put those two together. Now they argued like hell. And the whole time I was gone, they didn't talk to each other. Hmm. I know, interesting psychology. So there I'm in solitary confinement, and we started the treatment all over again with the CIA and what did you do and all this other stuff. And I told them, I was a file clerk with the 17th Data Processing Unit. Remember that. And then I found out there was a 17th DP. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. But they didn't know that I'd also gone through crypto repair. <clears throat> and that was that. I never told anybody that. Because <clears throat> one of the things that Manhart had said, who was a civilian, one of the highest ranking civilians in the State Department, that was in Hue, was captured. Uh, he said, watch out for ringers. Mm -hmm. And we found out who the ringers were when we Got up to D1. You mentioned some guy's name, something like Ariadne? Or? Riotti. Riotti. He's dead. Mm -hmm. Alphonse Riotti. He was a Marine, unfortunately. And uh, whatever he could do to get extra food, he did. And if it meant ratting you out, they would put him out on work details with you. And he'd sit there and be asking you questions and the usual shit. Yeah. Just basic stuff. Yeah, briefly from there, da 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 da. Some of the funny interviews, if you want to call them that, talking about your family. Well, what about my family? Your poor mother and your father. I didn't do it working in the rice paddies at home, worrying about you. And I said... Working in the rice paddies? Mm, no, no rice paddies. I said, no, my dad cuts the grass, but what's he do with the grass? Nothing. We have a lawn. There's grass. <laughs> you, you have a lawn. And they're trying to look up the word lawn. But no, there was there was there was <clears throat> there was humor if you wanted to look for it. Yes. Uh, most of these people that they had, as far as security guards, if you want to call it, they weren't very well educated. And uh, when you have one open up your little cell and ask you, "Do you have the moon in the United States?" Uh, it's kind of like, really. But we had gleaned from their own broadcasts. You can send a man to the moon and back, but you can't bring your troops back for 10,000 miles. We landed on the moon. Yeah, and that's when we told we, and when we told the little guy, he says, ah, come Linzo, no Russian, me, we own the moon. And he went back and reported to his superiors, and they wanted to know, how did you find this out? 
So we picked the nastiest guard that was there and said he told us. And he was gone. That afternoon, he was no longer in the camp. That was clever. That was clever. Uh, that's crafty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good craft. No, yeah. if you had, to, you had to listen very carefully to their broadcast because we had guys that spoke Vietnamese. Uh-huh. And the speakers outside the prison compound, when we got to plantation, because we left D1 the next day after the Sante raid. Okay. You went from D1 then to plantation and then later to Hanoi Hilton. Then to the Hanoi Hilton, yeah. Okay. We went to the Hanoi Hilton when the B-52 started bombing Hanoi. Right. There was chaff all over our buildings and there was shrapnel coming down into our buildings and uh, into our cell blocks. I'm sure and you were flying. <clears throat> that's when they swept us out and took us over to uh, over the, to the Hanoi Hilton. Okay. The interesting thing is when you go to that museum now, it's what it is, because <clears throat> most of it's been torn down. Mm. What is in its place is a multi-story, five-star hotel, condominium, business complex. Okay. The cell block that I was in with these other guys is the one that they kept. If I ever get to North Vietnam, I will look it up. I'm going to tell you. It's and a look worth, for it and see if they corrected the, the caption. It's a, it might have taken it down. Who knows? It's a worthwhile trip. Other than the flight. Mm-hmm. The currency was 22600 dong to a dollar. The food was outstanding. Mm-hmm. For 60000 dong or less, you could have a four-course meal. Mm-hmm. We went on a Saigon River cruise mm-hmm. with dinner and musical entertainment, and it cost us less than eight dollars a piece. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, we stayed in four-star hotels for less than a hundred a night, and uh, don't worry about running to the bank to change money. They'll take a little percentage, of course, sure. but. <clears throat> They know what the percentage rate is. You give them a hundred dollar bill, they'll give it to you in dong. Okay. You have a lot of dong getting ready to leave, go there. It's a, it's open twenty four seven, for I understand, or whenever flights go out, you go in there and take your dong, exchange it, and they'll give you American money and off nice. you go. Okay. It's a good tip. Now, <clears throat> internal is altogether different. It's two separate airports. Mm. Okay. I believe they were 737s. You're going to love this one. We're sitting there waiting to fly to, to Fubai. And this guy comes out of the pilot's staging area, whatever it is. He's got his hat on, wily ass hair. He reminded me of Foster Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> he came out and he's speaking English and everything, but not the you know the usual like I'm drunk type thing. But he comes out, he just he just it just hit me that he that he kind of looked like Foster Brooks, and and I'm sitting there going, oh shit, and I'm thinking <laughs> that, of that routine with Dean Martin where he's talking about uh, I'm the pilot, you know. <laughs> But they got a little bus that comes out, steep, steep steps that you got to get up to in the plane because it's not the usual come out. You get up in the plane, fly to Fubai. Fubai is altogether different from what it used to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, there might be some semblance of military have been there, U.S. military. I mean, it's all nice homes, super highway. Hmm. Nice hotels. People speak English. Run across some Vietnamese 
that remember TV station, mm -hmm. and they're in their probably 60s or older. But the average population over there is less than <clears throat> is less than 40, and a lot of them oh, have no less concept of the war. Yeah. And talk with some people, then they would speak in hushed tones and constantly look around to see if they're being watched uh, about the brutality of, of the Vietnamese when they came down the north. <clears throat> but it's changed. You, you, you go into, into the southern part of the country, the old Republic of Vietnam, I mean, it is vibrant. I mean, hotels and all kinds of business. I mean, Mercedes dealerships, BMW dealerships, VW, Ford, Chevy, uh, a gazillion motorcycles running around, great big hotels, 